Good morning. My name is Patrick Rickley. I am an elder here at City Church, and I'm really excited for the opportunity to come preach again. Um, I guess the first time wasn't all that bad, so I'm back again, but this time with a headset, so I get to use fo- my hands fully. Speaking of hands, I saw a post, thought it was very funny, that today there are people out there that don't realize this is their last weekend with all 10 fingers. So have a safe 4th of July. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Quick. Hey, can we get a quick round of applause for the band? But yeah, they, they bring it every single time. They really do. They do such a great job. I love rocking out with them. They're so good. Um, they're really amazing. Listen, if you're a first time guest here, thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing City Church. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. And um, we're really excited that you're here. If you haven't, please fill out a connect card. If you don't know where to find one, um, find somebody with a lanyard on. They'll be able to get you set straight. What's that? <laughs> yeah, find find Maddie over here. She will just you know what? Even if you're even if you're not a first time guest, just find Maddie over here. Look, City Church, we we love we love our people that are that serve diligently. And if, if you're looking uh, if you're looking for opportunities to serve, again, please find someone with a lanyard. They'll they'll get you set up. We could always use help in children's ministry, tear down, set up. Um, even the worship, I mean, just, just everything. There's a lot that goes into making this presentation and, and getting this, you know, um, all ready for everyone on, on Sunday morning. So if you feel called to do that, please do that. We're kicking off a sermon series called The Promises of God. And today, this is the first series. Today, we're going to be talking about money and finances. Right, yeah. I know that there's some people out there that are like, oof. We should have come next week. This wasn't money and finances. If you feel a little uncomfortable about that, that's, that's okay. Because it's kind of uncomfortable, right? Like the, talking about finances is just never really a fun thing to do, especially if the financial situation is not great. But there are a lot of promises that God makes about finances. And so we're going to talk about some of those today. Um, very blessed. Oh, getting a little... Check. There we go. Okay. Very blessed that when my wife and I started dating, uh, we met this guy. Well, we heard of this guy on the radio named Dave Ramsey, and I, I have to tell you that it was it was life changing. Um, early on, I, I was I was telling Nicole, I'm like, oh, there's this guy on the radio. He's talking about debt. He's talking about financial freedom. He's talking about breaking the shackles of of, of bondage and debt and and you know it's all this like big big stuff and you know and she's like oh, that doesn't sound all that fun and I'm like yeah yeah, yeah but you can, you can do a budget she's like bingo there we go let's do that budget I like that and that was really the key and I'll tell you something church Nicole and I have never fought about money we've been married for nine years and I promise not one time have we ever fought about money you're going to fight. You're going to fight. And, you know, we, we may fight a little bit here and there. Uh, what, what do they say? Money, sex, kids. But we have never fought about money. Um, it is true. It is true. And I think that is because the Bible is very clear about living intentionally, biblically, and, and giving you a roadmap of how to handle your money. Financial Peace University. Um, so because of this, because of our, our, this radical encounter we've had with biblical principles of money, Nicole and I started uh, Financial Peace University, so this will be our second go-around. Uh, it starts September of this year. More dates, more information will come. Some of you have already been through it. It's a good time. It'll get you set straight. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. I highly encourage if, if you want to, you know, even if you're in good standing and you want to be able to give more, like you want to be able to bless other people more, sign up for Financial Peace University. Maybe you've gone through it a while ago and you just need a refresher. Sign up. It's fine. We, we can get sponsorships. Uh, we'll make sure that if, if this is something that you want to do, we'll get you there. Don't worry about that part. Financial peace is really a blessing. When we were in Illinois for three months helping my mom through her stem cell transplant, um, we had the opportunity to be a, a, an influential voice in my brother's life. He and his wife were financially overextended, the truck, the camper, credit card debt. And then came the job loss, right? And then came, you know, other things that just seemed something goes wrong with the house. It's like when one thing happens, they all just seem to domino into the next. 
Some of you are out there going, huh? Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. So we got connected with FPU at a local church. A beautiful thing, they, they sold the boat. They sold the, cam- or they sold the camper, they sold the truck, started paying off debt, working two jobs, selling so much the dogs thought they were next. Anybody who's gone through Dave Ramsey knows that one. But something else happened. They found a group within FPU at the church, and they started to regularly attend church. And their regular attendance encouraged my parents to start regularly attending. Guys, there's more promises than just financial, right? Like, this, is, this isn't, this message, by the way, this sermon is not going to be, hey, do this and sign your check from God. You're a millionaire. Congratulations. It's not going to be like that, I promise. But it'll be good. The goal here is to, to live like no one else so you can live and give like no one else. Yeah, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to make sacrifices. Most of us, most of America anyways, is living on 120% of what they make. And God's asking you to live on 90% of what you make. But there's very important. Last time I preached, I preached about, I talked about the, the story of Abraham where he was about ready to sacrifice his son and all the while, God, God in his amazing economy, had a ram coming up the other side of the mountain. And typically, in that type of conversation, everybody is looking for their ram, right? But I'm asking you to be the ram. I'll get into that. So why are financial blessings so impactful? Well, I think it's because when you give cheerfully and from the heart, the recipient immediately knows who you serve. Luke 16, 13. If I can get that slide up. Luke 16, 13 says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. It's interesting they use enslaved. It's also interesting they call it the almighty dollar, right? They didn't get there on accident. But City Church is a very, very generous church. We've continuously given more to missions and benevolence every single year, just increasing how much we give. And I, I, I want to challenge us to give even more, right? Not just, not just in tithing, but to influence the kingdom, influence our, our city, because really, like, that's, that's the core of what we want to do, right? There's 55,000 people that don't know Jesus in Christ. There are plenty of opportunities for us to to make an impact. There are people who financially need it. And I'm telling you, when you serve the Lord and not the almighty dollar, making a financial donation to somebody, making, buying them tires, paying for dinner, buying groceries, when you do that, it makes a humongous impact in their lives and they can't see past it because they know that you don't serve money, you serve God. If I could... Back in our old, I'd love to tell a story, uh, our old building, there was a domino delivery driver. We were having lunch with the pastor. Everybody at the church was, was enjoying a, a kind of a meet and greet with the pastor after the service, and we had brought a domino d- delivery driver. We wanted to bless her with a large tip, and this was so cool. Like, it was so cool to watch this happen. This young lady, this poor, poor girl, she was up there for probably 30 minutes because the church passed around an envelope and then they passed it around again and then they passed it around one more time. Come on, church. They just kept passing this envelope around. She left with $427. Look, God loves a cheerful giver. He really does. He really loves a cheerful giver. It's, it is one of the... I think it's one of the best feelings in life. And I promise, I think the, the promise here is that if you bless others, your life will be better. You'll be happier. You'll be more fulfilled. And if you do it the way the Bible tells you, you'll likely have a better financial situation too. Um, I didn't include this in the slide, but I encourage anyone to read um, the book of Malachi. So the book of Malachi is the last book. It's the last time we hear, or it's the last book of the Bible before we hear from Jesus. Uh, So chapter uh, 3, verse 10. Challenge any one of you to to look at that. Relative to tithing, it's uh, it's good stuff. So if you're you're wondering, well, Patrick, how can I give more? Well, here and look. I've got some steps for you. 
Step one, understand that it's God's money in the first place. That's right. This is, this is a crucial and uh, often the most difficult step for people. Right, because, well, I went to work, I made the money, so, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't really think that God gave me the opportunity to do that, but he did. Deuteronomy 8.18 8, says, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Guys, it is through Christ Jesus and he alone that you're able to make money. First Chronicles 29.12-13 through 13, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Majesty, yeah. <laughs> you ever read a word sometimes and you're like, that doesn't sound right. How often do you say majesty in your daily life? <laughs> Raise your hand. Has anybody said it in the past week? <laughs> She's wrong. She hasn't said it. Okay. All right. And you see, it's difficult. Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. 12. The wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hands, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. What's happening here, right, this is, this is really interesting, because what's happening here is this is during the time of King David, and they're building a large temple. They literally, the church and King David himself, literally gave tons, tons, not just a couple shekels, tons of gold, silver, and precious stones to build this temple. Tons. And you might be thinking, well, you know, that's because they were, you know, they wanted to build this great temple. No, they, they did want to build an amazing temple that would last and that would be around for a long time. Why? Not to, not to have a, a monument or an idol or a statue to the Lord, but to build a place where people could come to have a radical encounter with the Lord and see lives changed. They got together to do this, and they built a massive temple, and it's written in, in, in history. I still struggle with understanding and, and accepting that it's all God's money, right? I want my stuff, too. I'm human. I do. But one thing that I make darn sure of is that I don't let that, that doubt creep in. And you have to, you, you've got to fight and you've got to pray for it. So if you're still wondering, okay, that's, that's, that's good, good news. Okay, I'll work on that. How can I keep giving me more? How can I give more? Step two, tithe. Proverbs 3, 9 tells us to honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Now, Nicole and I tithe on the gross, not the net. And this is not meant to be legalism. I promise you, this is not, I, I am not looking for a theological debate on tithing. Pastor Russ preaches on tithing in, in February, and I'm going to leave that to him to preach on tithing as a whole. We're going to touch on it a little bit here, okay? Um, I, th th we're talking about the heart here. And it is a heart issue for me that I tithe on the gross because I don't think the government is my savior. So therefore, if I give them the first fruits and then tithe on what's left, that to me is not giving first fruits. Russ often gets asked the question, should I tithe on the gross or the net? And his answer is yes. Just do it. Just start, start somewhere, okay? Again, don't let that doubt creep in. What could I do with that extra 10%? Right? Some of you are probably thinking, see, I told you, church just wants your money. I told you. And the answer is yes. That's true. But that's not it. That's missing context. That's, that's false. That's bad teaching. The, the church does want your money. That is true. The reason why is that they have your money, they have your heart. That's important to understand. Church isn't going to say, hey, uh, just turn over all of your cash and, and live in squalor so we can have all your money and, and have a, a, a great stage and a great band, right? That's, that's not what they want. What they want is you to feel, be cheerful about giving your tithe. Deuteronomy 15.10, you shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be 
grudging when you give to him. Because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake. Oof. Come on. Come on. Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. No man should appear before the Lord empty-handed. For each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. So, you know, you may be sitting in the rabbit like, oh, I don't really have the margins. Well, that's fine. There you go, right there. In proportion to the way you have blessed you. Oh, but go back a little bit. He will bless you the more that you undertake, right? The more you work, the more you work towards this, he's going to bless you more. And I, I fully believe that that is, that is why we've, we've never fought about money. And that is a huge blessing. And for those, for those couples out there that have had arguments about money, you know that it, it's stressful. And what a blessing it would be to just take that topic, that often argument, and just throw it out the window, never to hear from it again. That's a blessing in itself, let me tell you. So if you're still wondering, how could I give more? Step three, be good stewards of what you've been given. Last week, Russ said, Pastor Russ said, why ask for just enough? Right? Pray for abundance. You know what you can do with abundance? Be abundantly generous. And if you have abundance to be abundantly generous, your life will be better. You will be more fulfilled. You will be happier. I promise you. And if you're not, come talk to me. We'll get you all your money back. It's fine. There's a, you know, I love, I love, we've been in the, the Old Testament a lot here, but I, I love the way that Matthew talks about the parable of the three servants in the New Testament. And I, I love parables just in general because they can apply to so many different things. This is a long one, so buckle up, folks. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver, and uh, five bags of silver, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant whom he had entrusted with the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. And I have earned five more. The master was full of praise, as you would expect. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibility. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the handling of this small amount. Now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops that I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least you could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they, will, they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ooh. Guys, that's, uh, that's tough. Yeah, um, it's like, okay, so invest money, right? 
Beauty of the parable, like I said, is that it can speak to many situations. This could be, you know, growing disciples, right? But it is also a very clear indication of how we need to handle our money. When it comes to your finances, your Father in heaven is entrusting you with his finances. Remember, step one, the money is not yours, right? So we're growing his money that he's given us so that we can give more and, and be a ram to other people, right? There are people who are going through something, and, they, and if you were to swoop in, pay for that bill, that electric bill that they can't pay right now. Pay for those tires or that oil change or something, car payment, you name it. And have an impact on their lives and tell them why you did it. When you grow your finances, you change family trees. Proverbs 13, 22. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. We saw this in Matthew, right? The sinner's wealth, that one bag of silver he had, was taken from him and passed it to those who would grow that money. The hoarding mentality does not produce prosperity. I know that this is going to be a little bit shorter of a sermon. I'm hoping to get you guys out of here, you know, and enjoy some time with your family, hopefully with all 10 fingers intact. Um, but I, I wanted to, I want to leave you with, with pragmatic steps on, on how to, to grow your finances. So if you continue to ask how to, how to give more, step four, get out of debt. Join us for FPU. It's a shameless plug. I know it. I don't care. <laughs> Let's do it. Pay off your debt. Tithe. Create financial margin in your life so you can give to others. Stop giving your fruits to those who want to keep you in bondage. J.P. Morgan, Amex, Wells Fargo. They don't want. They don't want to. They don't want to grow the kingdom. When you don't have debt to worry about, you can focus on being a blessing to others. That's an amazing opportunity. Said so this was going to be short. Uh, Dave, if you want to go ahead and come back up. Because I just saw him. He's just up there. How can I give more? And finally, step five. Give more. Sow seed to influence the kingdom. Be the ram that some to someone else that is in need of a financial blessing. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly we all, will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We saw through this sermon that it's in proportion to what you've been given, Right? This isn't a call to go throw, to, to empty your bank account and give it all away. That's not what we're asking you to do. But if you want to receive the promise of, of a happier life, because it's, it's in here, cheerful giver, God loves a cheerful giver, then, then find an opportunity to help somebody financially and show them what, who you actually serve. Luke 16, 9, and, and, and for those who don't know, I, I love reading through Luke because you know, Luke was a doctor. He had a, he had a medical mind, and so when he looked at things, he looked at them through a very technical lens. And I think this is really just an amazing, amazing glimpse of, of the person that is Luke. Here's a lesson. Use your worldly re resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they'll welcome you to an eternal home. If that's not a promise to give for, I, I don't know what else is. You know, this sermon was never about money. It's always been about the heart, right? Making sure that your heart is in the right place. Because if your heart is in the right place, money is just a medium. It's just a vessel, a vehicle to do something else, to influence the kingdom. really looking forward to the opportunity to help some of you through Financial Peace University and looking for, forward to the, seeing the church grow and give and be an influence 
in our city and beyond.